What is going on YouTube? It is your boy Faithful to God. A few days back, Benaya Israel made several appeals to sources in the community tab section on his YouTube channel in which he attempted to make a loose connection between the community of Jews that lived in Savannah, Georgia in the 1700s and the scribbling on the pews of First African Baptist Church in the same city. Unfortunately for him, he did not vet his sources very well and as you're going to see in a moment, he actually inadvertently made a claim for the very people that he rejects as Jews. On your screen, you can see one of the relevant posts which can be found in the community tab section on his YouTube channel. This is from an old book called Jews in North America, page 72. And here you're looking at various people who seem very excited by this. Uh, you see people saying this is getting gooder and gooder. Others, yes, this information is vital. And here you have, thank you so much for what you do. I refer people to your videos and have downloaded and read some of the books in your videos. And again, awesome work, fam. And here you have another person saying, whoa. But this one really stuck out to me. So Faith Hope Charity says, I'd like to know why black Israelites would escape the Inquisition of Europe to go to a country where black Israelites were enslaved. What happened to these Israelites in the USA? Did they remain free? C. Moran says, excellent question, family. Just excellent. Unfortunately for the folks who were leaving comments, they and Benaya Israel did not bother to vet the source. As you can see on your screen, you'll notice that while it is not highlighted in brackets, you'll see the phrase, many Israelites arrived in Savannah. That's what got most of these people excited. But what they didn't focus in on were the names at the bottom, and more importantly, the one that I've highlighted specifically, Mordecai Sheftail. Now, why is that significant? because we have an actual portrait that was made of Mordecai Sheftail and he looks exactly the way that Hebrew Israelites claim Israelites are not supposed to look. And yet in that very citation, Mordecai Sheftail is being referred to as an Israelite. And here is the Jewish encyclopedia entry for the Sheftail family. I want you to focus in on the highlighted portion on your screen. Furthermore, Mordecai's father, Benjamin, was an anti-slavery advocate. And while that feels commendable, it is unfortunate that his son did not share in the same sentiments. Now, how do I know this? Because his son actually owned slaves. This sincerely makes me wonder why Benaniah Israel did not bother to vet his source before he shared it with his audience. Furthermore, I wonder if Benaniah is at all aware of the fact that the Jews that he's making appeals to in Savannah own slaves in the 75% range. And throughout the rest of the country, they were in the 40% range. This would have included the Spanish and Portuguese Jews that he loves to make appeals to. Again, why did he not vet his sources before he showed them to his audience? The following source gives the history of Mikveh Israel, which was founded by the Sheftails, another Ashkenazi family, and the Sephardic Jews of Savannah, Georgia. But the grand irony here is that according to the previous source that we looked at, those Sephardic families would have owned slaves in the 75% range. How did Benaniah Israel not think about that before he decided to make an appeal to those sources? But I think it's time that we actually take a moment to listen to the history of that congregation in audio form to see if the evidence actually coalesces with this loose idea that Benaniah was attempting to angle for. It might surprise you to learn that Savannah's first Jews enjoyed more cultural, religious, social, and economic freedoms than other places in Europe or in any of the other colonies. Meanwhile, African Americans as a people group during that time, with the possible rare exception of a few, are experiencing hardship and slavery in the antebellum South. Yet those Sephardic Jews who Benaniah Israel would have you believe are somehow the kin to African Americans have their liberty and freedom? Oh, by the way, did I forget to mention that they own slaves in the 75% range? 
just one day after stepping off the ship. Which was not a slave ship, I might add, and was actually funded by those Jews in London who helped that group of Jews get to Georgia with all of their freedom intact. Meanwhile, the ancestors of African Americans during the same period are being shipped against their will, are being forced into slavery, have no freedom, and somehow Benaniah Israel didn't think about that when he decided to go and use that source? This group, the largest group of Jews to settle in colonial America, held their first worship service in Savannah. In those early years, services were held in members' homes and later in rented quarters. The settlers chose Mikveh Israel, the Hope for Israel, as their congregation's name. A few years later, the Jews that had escaped Spain and Portugal found themselves in Spain's crosshairs once again when 3,000 Spanish soldiers from Florida invaded Georgia. With fresh memories of the Inquisition and with the threat of being burned at the stake, the Spanish-Portuguese Jews quickly fled Savannah. Dr. Nunez and his family settled in New York, while others moved to Charleston and Philadelphia. This left the small group of Ashkenazi Jews to rebuild the congregation. So it wasn't even the Sephardic Jews who rebuilt the congregation, but rather the Jews that Benaniah would reject as being Jews. Talk about ironic. 87 years after arriving in Savannah, members were finally able to worship in their first permanent home. That dedication was notable because an organ was played. This was the first time in America that instrumental music was part of a Jewish service. About 10 years later, like so many other wooden structures of that time, fire destroyed the original building. 10 years later, a new brick building was erected. The congregation outgrew that building after the Civil War, and the present-day building was erected. As a side note, one of the interesting names that appeared in the list of names in the source that Ben and I used is one Emmanuel de la Mota, who was, as you can see on your screen, well, speaks for itself, doesn't it? I know a lot of Hebrew Israelites out there are into their conspiracy theories, so I figured I'd share this as well. Figured that it would be important that Hebrew Israelites would see this and, uh, well... You be the judge. Oh, and by the way, he was a Sephardic Jew. Just figured I'd put that out there. The truth is, I believe Benaniah Israel was trying to make some sort of connection, albeit faulty, with that community of Jews and the Georgia Pews in First African Baptist Church in Savannah, Georgia. Unfortunately for him, a video has already been made debunking that claim. The reality is that community of Jews are not who he thought they were and Solitreo does not actually appear on the Georgia pews in Savannah, Georgia. At some point in the future, I plan on making a video about one Aaron Lopez who you see on your screen on the left and his uncle Jacob Rodriguez Rivera on the right. Two Sephardic Jews, I might add. Why is that significant? Well, if you've been paying attention to this video, I think it's pretty obvious. To my Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ and those who are just Jewish in general, I hope you did not find this video to be anti-Semitic because trust me and believe, I did not intend for this video at all to offend any of you. But I did want to be honest and objective with the information as I brought it forth. If some of my tone sounded a little over the top, it was only because I wanted to highlight the ridiculousness behind Benaniah Israel's argument in trying to make some sort of weird connection between the community of Jews in Savannah, Georgia and the scribbling on the Georgia pews in First African Baptist Church. But needless to say, I would ask brothers and sisters out there to keep Benaniah Israel in prayer that hopefully he would understand why a lot of this falls in line with Titus 3 and 9. Truth be told, our righteousness should be found in Jesus Christ, as Paul, who is a natural Israelite, laid out in Philippians chapter 3 verses 1 through 9, who compares everything, even his fleshly identity, as being scubala in comparison to the knowledge, 
the surpassing knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior.